Um, is cultivating a habit of noting that doesn't correspond to a special mindfulness of the phenomenon a step in the wrong direction? Also, as you progress with the Mahasi noting, does it become difficult for one to be mindful without noting? Um, not sure if the first question uh, means really what I understand. Um, so to answer as I understand your question is yes, it um, would lead you in a wrong direction. Uh, you, you note everything that is arising in the present moment, what is the most pro prominent, that which is most uh, yeah, most prominent to you. So that is what you uh, what you note, what you focus on as long as it lasts. And what you um, uh, yeah? Do you think that is the the mm -hmm. question? Did I understand that? Correctly? They're asking about noting in some other way. Perhaps it means noting buddho buddho, or perhaps it means perhaps it's just speculative in terms of is it really important to have the noting the label correspond in some way to the object. Mm. If you want to, call, I don't know if that's that may be what um, is being asked. Well, the 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 label should respond uh, to the to what is going on. As I said, it it has to be done in the in the present moment. So when there is the rising of the abdomen, there should be the noting of the rising of mm. the abdomen and. Uh, when there is hearing, there should be the the noting of the hearing, and not something else. So, um, if you say um, something else when you hear actually something, and you say mm. buddho, it's not noting the present moment. So it wouldn't really make sense, and it mm. wouldn't really make sense to when you have a hearing and and you say or something else or you don't know it at all so oh. that wouldn't really make sense or if you s if you hear something and say dog if you hear a dog and say dog dog i think oh. that's a practical example that we often get mm. and for for the second question uh, i don't know if it really becomes difficult to um to be mindful without noting, I wouldn't say it is difficult. It it becomes a habit, and then it's easy. So uh, you train it, and then your mind works that way. It takes a while to to make your mind work that way, but once it does, it's it's natural. Mm. Um, and uh, not difficult anymore. So the, the part uh, when you experience it as difficult is only lasting a while. And that how long that lasts depends on how much you practice. So the more you practice, the faster it becomes a habit and uh, the easier it gets quick or... Um, yeah, you said, I mean, you... M mindfulness itself becomes a habit. If you're doing anything that cultivates mindfulness, then it can only make being mindful easier. No? Mm. So I mean, usually you won't you won't feel you should hold the mic up. your uh, usually <laughs> you won't feel your your lips when you are speaking. But when you are mindful and and you can notice it. And uh, usually you don't feel the, the foot when you are walk, walking. But with walking meditation, we train to feel it. So uh, then you can't hardly walk without being mindful on, on, on something. Um, and then your mind, as an effect, becomes much calmer. 
because you are just with what is going on and not with thousands of other things going mm -hmm. hushing and rushing through your mind one thing about I've uh, had some thoughts on this just some observations on the non-corresponding um, non-corresponding labeling or noting uh, because it has it has it's a broad sort of subject why we why we have a word at all is of our, because of our understanding of the word sati which we always translate as mindfulness the word sati comes from the root sar which means to remember or to recall something so the buddha himself explained mindfulness as when walking one knows i am walking of course in pali it's one word gachami which means i am walking it's really first person i am walking or i walk but you don't have to say I, you can just say gachami, which means a first person undergoing walking. When standing, one knows I am standing. When there is a painful feeling, one knows there is a painful feeling. So this, this uh, re bringing to mind or remembering the object for what it is, as the Buddha used the word patisatimatta, uh, he said the way you do it is you have patisatimatta ya anisito javiharati, you dwell not clinging to anything or not dependent on anything uh, be remembering things just for what they are the sati pati sati matta remembering things just as they are because that creates a clear awareness of the object as it is it brings the mind closer to that object the the, the word doesn't really matter what it is as long as the word has the effect of bringing the mind closer to the object as it is. One, bringing it closer to the object. Two, keeping it on the object. Three, preventing proliferation based on the object. It has these three qualities to it. If you don't use the word, your mind will not ever, or, or will be hard pressed to fully fix on the object. This is why people practice buddho, this is why they practice om, because the word focuses the mind on the object, whatever that object, spiritual or mundane, might be. When you say to yourself, pain, pain, the mind you know, uh, is drawn to the pain. It, it gravitates towards the pain naturally. As soon as you, so obviously if you were to say something like, well, for example, some people will do this, if you feel pain, they'll say, happy, 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 because they want to feel happy, or they'll say, no pain, no pain, no pain, because they want to have no pain. So ask yourself, what does that do? Does that bring the mind to see the pain clearly for what it is? No. What, what it does is create aversion in the mind and create a, a, a desire in the mind and, and a tendency in the mind to recoil from the pain, which the point is people see that as the goal as the or as the practice. This is why they take medication and so on. So we have this idea that meditation is going to be another drug that allows us to get away from pain. If we have pain, we say, no pain, no pain, no pain. Some people do this. If if you use a word that is not related at all, it's just going to create confusion. Of course, I don't. I, I doubt that that's you're you're seriously con considering that as a meditation practice. Like if you feel pain, to say apple, 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 or something. You might say some other object as a means similar to no pain to get your mind onto something else. If there's pain, suddenly start. Ca you know, if when people have anger, for example, valid meditation technique. You have anger in the mind and you say to yourself, 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, counting down from 100. Eventually you forget about the anger, right? So it's a means of getting rid of the anger, but it doesn't teach you about the anger. This is the crucial difference between what we do and what many other meditation, mantra meditation practices do. We're actually using the mantra to bring us closer to the object as opposed to avoiding the mundane reality. But the really interesting part is when people use spiritual mantras to describe mundane phenomena. And this happens in Buddhism. Um, and so, so please, I, I don't want to come across as too critical or anything, but as an observation, you can see where it tends to lead people. For example, there are teachers, and they might, you know, th from their point of view, they're totally correct, but th there seems to be some suspicion and perhaps some correlation here that they watch the breath and say, Buddho, Buddho, 
Okay. Now, Buddha, Buddha is the name of, of our teacher, but it also means one who knows. So, and and, and they, they realize this. So they watch the breath saying, one who knows, one who knows, one who knows, one who knows. And some of the teachers that I've heard will actually come to a realization that the breath is the one who knows, and there is the one who knows, and there is this mind that is permanent and stable and lasts forever and just knows. And I've been told that, you know, that's just a figure of speech, but if it's not a figure of speech, it, it seems quite suspicious to me that the mind, that there could be a mind that lasts forever. Um, there could be a knowing of anything that lasts forever, because that knowing had to arise from something. You know, it, it arose out of nothing. It, it came into being at some point, and therefore, meaning, Buddha said all all consciousness is impermanent. Any any knowing that could arise would be impermanent. But this seems to be a potential problem that comes from mixing mundane and, and spiritual. You know, the, the the idea of of some one who knows or just knowing with with the actual breath instead of saying breathing or 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 feeling in the body. You know what, what the actual sensations are, or as we say, rising, falling. There's another group that does, um, <coughs> they, they use something similar to Buddha, but they say Samma Arahang, Samma Arahang, which is just another name for the Buddha, but Samma means right, Arahang means worthy, or or you could say enlightened, rightly enlightened. Uh, and at the same time, or, or maybe not at the same time, but they also somehow throughout it develop, that's right, they do it, they develop this, vision of a crystal ball, a little crystal, a little light of some sort at different parts of the body and all the way to, through the breath, from one end of the breath to the other, all the way down to just above the the navel. And I've heard some incredibly um, different things from, from this group. They will say, and eventually you realize that this is this is this is the mind or this is the truth or this is the the ultimate reality this is the body of the dhamma and it exists here at the last base where you um, where you lead this imaginary crystal eventually you see this crystal right above your navel and they say this is the center of gravity which is the middle way therefore right it's in the middle of the body so because it's the center of gravity it's the middle way and that's where the mind lives and they say the mind is this big, and, and, and so on. And if you listen to them talk, it's really, what's going on is they're, they're bringing together these different concepts, right? The, the crystal ball, samma arahang, and the breath, and, and, and the mind, you know, so as a result, the mindfulness that comes in the mind is a mindfulness of this, this view that, uh, that, that this is the right uh, truth that is this crystal ball, at the center of the body where the breaths where the breath ends so that i think is some you know you can see that as a criticism or or a potential argument or a debate or or a controversial point but uh as an example just from uh, from from one point of view this is a potential something that may be a problem if people um are not perfectly clear impartial and precise about the noting, and therefore we can see the importance of using the correct word, I think. Okay. Dog, it's, it's, it will always be the concept, and, and, and um, you, 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 can't, you can't explain that to, to somebody, and, and you, you, you can't experience this dog. Right. But that's you can't. You can experience hearing. That's a very important something that I didn't mention. Is that, yeah, very that the Too bad the difference between record. <laughs> I'm recording actually. Oh. I, I missed the first <laughs> part. Uh, the difference between concepts and reality. Um, that's a whole other issue, actually, really, because a concept can be an adequate object of meditation. In fact, I was teaching dog meditation in my first kids video. Mm. The first kids video, you learn how to meditate on a dog, saying dog, dog, dog. But then you're focusing on a picture of a dog. You're not focusing on, on the sound of the dog. You, you could actually. Focusing on a dog bark, the sound of a dog barking, and say to yourself, dog, because in the mind there will arise a picture of a dog. 
So it is actually a, a, a valid meditation technique. It won't lead you to an understanding of reality. Why? Because it's not real. It's something that has arisen in your mind, this concept of a dog. The reality of it is a vision in the mind, a sound at the ear, the experience which um, which uh, really does occur. The so so the the importance of using a word like hearing 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 is that it pairs away the concepts. It eventually, in the beginning, it doesn't. In the beginning, the mind is still caught up in concepts, still not really practicing correctly. But eventually, it the mind pairs away everything, because again and again you're saying to it, "No, it's not a dog. It's just hearing. No, it's not a dog. It's just hearing. But it's a dog. No, it's just hearing. But it's a but it's a nice dog. No, it's just hearing. But I like the sound. No, it's just sound." And eventually the mind says, oh yes, it's just sound, it's just hearing. So it, 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 this is the importance of it. If you say dog, 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 you'll never get to that point. You'll never pare away all of the liking and disliking and the, 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 the concepts of it because you'll never get down to what is actually there. And the mind will never say, oh, it's just a dog. The mind will never say that because the mind will never, it will keep looking, where's the dog, where's the dog? You can, you can make it pretend, but it's like, okay, a dog. But it will never get this this realization because that's not the experience. So yeah, very important to know the difference between concepts and reality, which is difficult. I think even just talking about it doesn't doesn't give it to most people. If you've never practiced intensive meditation, I've I've seen many people people give their their confusion on this subject. What do you mean this is just a concept? What do you mean this is just reality? It's true that if you've never really experienced it, it seems quite confusing and, and hard to tell the difference. But that's really just a sign that, that we are still um, dwelling in ignorance. For, for a person who's meditated, it's hard to understand how you could not tell the difference between what you're actually experiencing and, and, and a concept. It takes time. Once it, it takes the mind to settle down it takes the mind to stop spinning around and stop adding our projections and our views onto everything and just seeing things as they are to be able to say, oh, this is really here and all that stuff is not really here. All that stuff was arising in my mind, for example.